Hello, and welcome to the Brooklyn Rails Special Summer Series, curated by the Rails Editors. During the weeks of July 19 and July 26, we are celebrating the sections that make up the Brooklyn Rail, which you can find in print and on our website, free and accessible. Our conversations this week will celebrate the editorial diversity covered in the rail and here in our virtual events. I'm Charlie Schultz, Managing Editor at the Rail. I've been the Managing Editor for over four years. One of my favorite aspects of being the Managing Editor is that I closely read more than 100 articles spanning the seven pillars of the humanities every month. I always feel intellectually energized. I'm also constantly being shown all that I don't know. So the opportunities for continued learning are infinite. Today, I'm hosting my colleagues, Amanda Gluey-Busy and Ben Clifford, who are both scholars and editors of the Rails Art Review section, as well as Jessica Holmes, who edits the Art Tonic column for the Rail. Today, we're going to be discussing two exhibitions. <clears throat> Alexander Calder, Modern from the Start, You've Come a Long Way, Baby, The Sapphire Show. What interests the assembled critics is less a comparison of the two shows than a consideration of each on their own terms, but also what one show has to tell us about the other, if anything. Um, to begin with, we're going to start by talking about our experience of seeing the two shows. So I'm going to begin our conversation by asking uh, my illustrious guests, um, how did seeing these two shows in conjunction um, affect your experience of, of them uh, after you walked away. Uh, maybe to start, we will uh, use the alphabet and go first to Amanda. Thanks, Charlie. <laughs> well, I had a, a kind of interesting experience seeing both of them. Um, first of all, because I saw the Calder show before I knew we were doing this program. So I, I didn't know that I would be seeing it in conjunction with You've Come a Long Way, Baby. But also, I was the editor who edited both of the Rails reviews of these shows. So I have a very interesting perspective on them because of course I edited those reviews before I even got to see the shows. <laughs> so that was kind of fascinating to me. Um, one thing that really struck me is, um, especially as an art historian, looking at history that we kind of feel we already know, although perhaps we don't know Calder as, as well as we think we do. Um, this is something that our author points out actually in the review that there hasn't been a comprehensive biography yet. Um, and this is an artist who's so clearly richly deserving of one. And then also looking at the Sapphire show and this art history that should have already been really examined, but is still being examined. And so for me, it was kind of a fascinating way of thinking about these, these two, um, I don't know, two ends of the spectrum in terms of like knowledge we think we know and don't have and knowledge we should know and don't have. Um, and so that then made them really, really interesting to think about together. Yeah, thanks Amanda. Uh, ben, would you uh, would you care to give us your your uh, experience of the the two shows and how they influenced your uh, your thinking about them? Of course, thank you, Charlie. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, as far as seeing the two shows in conjunction, the thing that it really did for me was that it made me think a lot about different kinds of uh, specifically institutional histories, because in the MoMA show. Uh, the relationship of Calder, who's of course, you know, he's like a highly, he's a canonized modernist master, you know, familiar to most of us, all of us. And, but the show foregrounds his history with the museum itself. MoMA itself is the kind of secondary protagonist of the whole show um, in a lot of ways. Um, they're very self-conscious about that. And uh, I, saw, I saw the Calder show first and noted that because it's such an important part of the way the show is put together. Um, and then I saw the Sapphire show afterwards with those thoughts kind of already bouncing around in my head in the context of Calder. And it made me think very much about, I mean, this, this really kind of hit home less in the main body of the Sapphire show, um, but in the two vitrines that they have towards the front of the gallery of um, ephemera. Um, there's very little that is that survives related to the original Sapphire show itself, 
but what does survive, I believe it's, it's basically a poster is the only, the only kind of material, uh, you know, the only thing that, that remains archivally speaking, but they gathered all sorts of other things related to the community that surrounded the show, the community that surrounded the gallery that put it on gallery 32 in Los Angeles and a couple of other venues that they talk about the Brockman gallery and uh, the Watts Tower Art Center in Los Angeles that were very concerned with, um, uh, you know, African American artists, the black art community in Los Angeles at that time. And I thought it was really interesting, really important and very revealing that, you know, they, they take pains to describe how the original Sapphire show was unique and distinctive in its, you know, exclusive emphasis on women black artists, but also the fact that it inhabited this larger ecosystem um, and a larger community at the time. And of course, it's not the same kind of institutional history as what you get at MoMA. Um, but when you're dealing with artists and communities that are not included in canonical histories and indeed suppressed by canonical histories, these are the kinds of less formal, less institutionalized institutions and communities that like we need to tell the histories of. So I felt that that was a really interesting kind of, you know, similar but different kind of thing that united my experience in the two shows. Thanks, Ben. I, I, I really, uh... I like what you're saying there. I, I, I took down some notes too because I felt like the, um, you know, what I remember uh, educating myself about the Sapphire show as uh, as I was in the room was, um, uh, and correct me if I uh, mis misstate this history, but I, I recall learning that uh, the decision to put the show on was um, uh, essentially reactionary to, uh, you know, a moment where women of color artists had been left out of a, of a yeah. quote unquote more official art viewing opportunity and that uh, that the impetus for the original show was already uh, kind of a matter of correcting some sort of a mainstream record uh, and I really I, I, I appreciate uh, I appreciate a lot the the, the counterculture nature of, of that kind of an enterprise yeah no doubt um, Jess, would you share with us uh, your your experience of seeing the shows in conjunction? Yes. Um, thank you, Charlie and the Rail, for having me here as well. I'm happy to be here. Um, I have to say, you know, I didn't select talking about Alexander Calder today, but mm -hmm. I was delighted to be able to do so. Um, you know, in my previous life, I worked for nearly 20 years for the Calder Foundation. So um, I've been steeped in Calder history for a long time. So seeing a historical show of Calder now um, is interesting to me because I've, I've seen sort of the evolution of his being canonized over the past 20 years. Um, when I began at the Calder Foundation back in the late 90s, um, he was, it was not so, it wasn't as natural to automatically think of Calder when you're thinking of um, the important early 20th century American artists. Um, I think that this show uh, did, a, I think it did a good job of both um, explicating Calder's long-standing history with MoMA and also um, sort of elucidating just kind of how much of an outsider he was in his own time. Um, he was always really very much a striver um, in his day. And so um, I think the show very subtly kind of unfolds that bit of the story. Um, you know, especially with some of the ephemera they were able to include um, his wish lists and his letters to Barr and all this other stuff. Um, I saw the Calder show first as well, and then immediately saw the Sapphire show afterwards. And what really struck me is just, um, again, like both uh, Amanda and Ben touched on, I think um, just how little the organizers had to, to go on to kind of uh, replicate the show and then and because there isn't so much to go on you can't replicate it you have to sort of take a different approach um, so the history is really sort of an inspiration for an exhibition that felt to me um, very much of this moment yeah thanks Jess um, I, I'm <laughs> I, I, I think it's hard to undervalue 
two decades of uh, time around any artist's body of work, <laughs> I, uh, I can only imagine the deep well uh, of Calder that you carry with you everywhere you go. Um, one of the things we've all touched on is, is the historical nature of these two shows. Um, and that is one thing that, that unites them uh, as disparate as the artists are and their histories are. Um, so in terms of there being historical presentations, what did you feel was successful? What did you feel was less successful? Maybe we'll go reverse this time, Jess, and you can, uh, you can answer this one. Yeah, sure. Um, I think, you know, I think that the Calder show, um, one of the things that is great about it is the museums, you know, the museum has a deep reserve of Calder works and its ability to pull from its collection things that have either never been seen or rarely been seen is obviously um, a pleasure. And there are a couple of works that I can think of. Um, I don't I don't know if you want me to touch on them now or we can get more into it later, but- um, Let's get into it when we get into the nitty gritty of the yeah, conference. Yeah, but I think that was, um, you know, it's a, it's a delight for me to be able to see things that I've never seen before. Um, you know, I think the, the examples of the early works are um, beautiful. Uh, I think Calder's early history now, the circus to the wire sculptures, and the wood into abstraction is pretty well established and it's a little bit harder to, um, to kind of uh, re-spin that in different ways. Um, however, I think the inclusion of a, a bunch of these new works and honestly, I think the letters at the end um, were really revealing um, of especially of some of the works that, um, that aren't, that Momo doesn't usually show. Uh, in terms of the Sapphire show, um, I mean, I was actually introduced to a couple of artists in that exhibition that I was not familiar with. Some of them I were, um, which, uh, you know, I, like you, I'm always um, eager to learn new things. Um, and then of the artists that I did know, um, you know, it was great to see how a couple of them especially were really already so fully formed even in the late 60s, early 70s. Um, you know, some of the later works were um, a little bit hit and miss for me, but um, there were a couple as well that I found really extraordinary. So, um, you know, I, I think the exhibition did a, a solid job of intermingling the new with the old in a way that sort of presents a case for this show's history. Yeah, I, I, I agree that it was an interesting, it was an interesting decision on the part of the curators to, um, to show work that was made in the last couple of years alongside uh, the work that had been made in the 60s and 70s. Uh, to that end, one of the things that surprised me was how fresh some of the pieces from the 60s and 70s felt. There was a number where I, 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 I felt, take it out of this context and put it somewhere else and you could easily tell me that it was made last year. Um, and, you know, and, and there were, but I think we can get to there a little bit later. I also think it's really remarkable, uh, the difference that each, each place is starting with, you know, like uh, Calder for MoMA, uh, I imagine that one of the primary challenges must have been like, you know, hewing that, hewing it down to a narrative that that um, could be, you know, expressed in what like three rooms in a hallway, mm -hmm. um, versus the Sapphire show where it seems they had, you know, the opposite uh, situation to work with. So we really, you know, trying to approach what I would presume to be similar goals, which is to, you know, set up an exhibition that carries a true historical narrative. Um, but from such totally different starting places. Uh, so Ben, I'm curious to hear, what was your, what was your thoughts on um, elements of each show where the historical presentation was uh, particularly successful or, or, or left wanting? So as far as Calder goes, I should say, you know, uh, I'm far from an expert on Calder, so it's difficult for me to, you know, it's difficult for me to say what they're bringing to the, you know, the Calder story um, that's particularly fresh as opposed to something well-established, like, you know, as, as Jess touched on, she's in a much better position to, to, 
to describe that. But like, I mean, as I alluded to before, I think the way that they uh, kind of intertwined the, the history of Calder and the history of MoMA was effective and illuminating for me. I always, I knew he was associated with the institution, but I didn't, it was, I didn't know quite how intimate that association was over the years. Um, although, I mean, by necessity, uh, you know, there are certain parts of that association and relationship that as a, as someone who's, you know, not involved with the institution, maybe I look a little bit more askance on than MoMA does, but you know, that's part and parcel with what's going on. They, they're going to present it in a largely kind of celebratory way, you know, that's, that's their perspective. So, but I, I did think it was effective, you know, and, and like I said, I wasn't really aware quite how tight the relationship was. Um, I would, as far as the Sapphire show goes, I mean, I, I also was very struck by the way the uh, organizers intermingled um, works from, you know, the, the, the 60s and early 70s, the period of the show with much more contemporary works. Um, and in a way, I mean, the way, and, and, and also the way it was sometimes difficult, you know, it was not immediately obvious, you know, which, which was which. There was a lot of continuity. There was a lot of uh, kind of consistency of vision and execution in a lot of the works. And I think that it created a situation for me where the historical narrative was not terribly straightforward, but that was a strength. And I think that it was key to what they were trying to do at the exhibition. Because for me, I think the aims of the exhibitions differ a little bit. They're both historically, they're both very much based in a specific historical phenomenon or narrative. But I think ultimately the goal of this, the, the Sapphire show at Ortizar is trans-historical. It's mm. about kind of tangling uh, it's about tangling those those kind of teleologies and strands and indicating ways that practice, uh, artistic practice, um, kind of escapes uh, simple trajectories, I guess. Um, and, you know, the whole concept of the show, the idea of this kind of return, return or, or, or you know, uh, recovery of a historical phenomenon or historical occurrence it, that's in some way out of historical sequence, a recreation out of sequence, I, I think is central to what they were trying to do. Yeah, I like that phrase a lot, trans, trans historical narratives. I, uh, I feel that uh, uh, many of us who grew up learning art history 20 years ago are gonna be, we're just gonna have a different sense of the canon because uh, I think one of the great things uh, our generation of, uh, organize, of, of exhibition makers, critics, scholars, and thinkers is really um, trying to uh, not just validate, but bring higher all of the different um, historical narratives that uh, many of us didn't get a chance to learn about when we were getting yeah. uh, you know, the preliminary phases of our education. Um, yeah, I like that a lot. Thanks, Ben. Um, Amanda, would you uh, would you share with us your um, thoughts on the historical presentations where things were successful or or, or less so? Sure. Um, yeah, Charlie, your mentioning of the canon reminds me when I was in college and took my women in art history class. The very first day, the professor told us to take out a piece of paper and to write down the names of ten women artists. And, you know, so, I mean, if you've never taken a class in that and it's the 90s, that's really hard to do, right? And just as you're like patting yourself on the back, like, yeah, I'm a feminist, I can do this. Then the next question was, okay, now write down the names of 10 women artists who aren't white. Oof. And nobody in the class could do it, um, including myself. And, uh, you know, I think that these shows are, are doing something super, super important. Um, and, you know, what Ben says is true, that it's actually kind of taking this history out of um, a teleology. And I think that that's actually really, really important because these artists were left out of the original teleology. So they, they have the, the opportunity now not to have to fit that. Um, so I think that that's actually a really exciting thing to think about. Um, the period of time that the Sapphire show took place, that's actually my period as an art historian. Um, and I'm embarrassed to say that I had never heard of it until I read Kelly Jones's book, South of Pico, um, which is a history of, of LA artists um, of color and one I would really, really recommend. One of the things that really struck me um, 
in both shows, and I'll start with the Sapphire show since I'm talking about it already, is that this, this is not what the Sapphire show would have looked like hung in the 60s. Um, it was hung in, um, from what I can understand, a space that was essentially like an apartment space and in a Mediterranean revival space, um, which of course are, you know, those beautiful buildings are all over Southern California. Um, so that's something interesting to think about. Also really interesting to think about um, is the space that Ordazar is in right now. Um, it's in this amazing, amazing loft, tin ceiling, um, columned space in Tribeca. Um, so, you know, we're thinking then about galleries um, that were happening in Soho, um, just starting to happen in Soho at the time. Um, think about something like 112 Green Street, um, which became really, really famous for showing people like Smithson and um, Gordon Meta Clark. Um, a gallery that opened and was really committed to showing African American artists. Um, was not actually in Tribeca or Soho in New York. It was actually um, called Just Above Midtown Gallery um, and was kind of in a more traditional gallery space. Um, it had parquet floors and um, as far as I can tell, white walls um, from black and white photographs. Um, that was actually owned by Linda Good Bryant, um, an African-American herself. And so she really, really focused on this, this material, um, but that didn't open until 74. Hmm. And so when we talk about this being like out of historical time for New York, sadly, this actually totally is out of art historical time. Um, there were not shows of this work in New York in this period. And so I think that that's actually super, super important to, to point out. Um, being in the Tribeca space, we can kind of put ourselves in the mindset of what it could have looked like to, to see this work from the 60s and 70s in the spaces where artists, um, avant-garde artists were really, really interested in showing. Um, but this particular type of show did not happen in New York City at this period. Um, the Sapphire show is from the 60s, not from the 70s. And then the Calder show, one of the things that really struck me is um, how institutional it looked. Mm -hmm. um, it looked official. And, um, I, you know, I think that's partly MoMA and it's partly being in those, those side galleries and stuff. But I think also this is kind of MoMA. Um, acknowledging that Calder was the house artist for a long time and actually for the first time perhaps kind of owning that in our in our contemporary world. Um, I felt like it didn't have the playfulness necessarily that I really love to see from Calder. Um, and I'm thinking about two exhibitions, um, well, one exhibition and one installation. Um, there was a, a weird show at Levy Gorby in 2015 where they had Calatrava design the, um, the, the stands um, and the vitrines. And it was just bizarre. Um, and kind of like you walked into a spaceship that just happened to be showing Calder. Um, I don't think that was necessarily more historically accurate but it did do something with the work. Um, it did allow them to be these, these strange little objects that I, I really loved. And then I was also thinking about the, the Calder installation that used to be hung at the National Gallery in Washington. Um, it was hung in a really, really tall space. And so you could go to a mezzanine and look at it from the side, but actually mostly you saw it from below. Um, and so it was this very, very odd way of thinking about Calder mobiles um, that you were constantly under them. And I remember the first time I saw it, I, I remember thinking like, oh, this is what it's like to be under the water lilies in a Monet painting. Um, because all of these leaves and wonderful fish and things like that were floating above you. And that was something that I kind of missed. Um, in the, the MoMA installation was just, uh, the, first of all, the opportunity totally to walk around things, but also the, the kind of ad hoc nature of Calder, which I think is, to me at least, is important to his work. Yeah, 
Thanks, Amanda. I really appreciate you um, uh, pointing out so clearly how the Sapphire show um, is so evidently outside the historical narrative of, of New York art. And, um, you know, I think it's important that I'm, I'm glad to see that the show has gotten a lot of um, acknowledgement uh, from various levels of the press and a lot of discussion because um, from my position as a managing editor, I feel that uh, a baseline of history is laid when official notice is taken. Um, <clears throat> and wh whether that is a matter of just having some photographic record or something more significant, uh, published documentation uh, and critical thought for people of another generation to, um, to, 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 to put their feet on when they stand and, and reassess the landscape of, of, of the history that you know, we all share um, outside of the different narratives. One question that I had uh, for all of you, and maybe we can move through this question, not exactly lightning round, but closer to it, uh, because I would like to get into discussions of the shows themselves. But, um, but given that these are both historical shows, granted there were a couple of uh, contemporary works in the Sapphire show, my question is whether there were pieces um, that communicated to you outside of their place in history. Were there works that had an energy that you felt that you did not need the story? You didn't need a wall label. You didn't need any of the historical armature and the object just, you know, presented itself in its, in its, you know, wondrous, wondrous current hood. <laughs> um, <laughs> Jess, go to you first on the lightning round here. Okay. Um, I mean, in the Calder show to me, yes, there are a couple of, I mean, the, the snow flurry mobile, which maybe we'll talk about a little later. Um, to me, it doesn't really need a story. It's sort of an, it's, it's the kind of mobile that when you think of Calder, it's what you're, you hope you're going to see. I mean, it's got something okay. like 30 or 32 discs and they're all moving around at different places and you don't know what it's going to do next. And you could stand in front of it for an hour and never see the same thing twice. And I mean, I think, um, you know, if, if anyone's making a case for Calder, um, being in the canon. I mean, that's kind of what you think of. Um, you know, he made that mobile in like 48, I think. Um, he made a few of those mobiles and the MoMA one is probably one of the best ones. Um, and it's just, you know, if, if they had it, put it in a gallery all by itself, I mean, I think it would probably draw the same kind of interest. Um, for the Sapphire show, I mean, you know, it's hard for me to just choose one because so much of the work was new to me, but I really have been thinking about um, Senga Ningudi's um, water compositions, which to me were so, um, I mean, not only like just eye-catching and beautiful on a surface level, but I mean, to me, they seem to um, belong to like a continuum of 60s art history. Um, you know, they're, like they're, they're so minimal, you know, they could fit alongside all of those other artists. And it was kind of, you know, I mean, I sat there looking at them and just thinking like, why are these not being shown alongside all these other guys, really? <laughs> Thanks, Jess. Ben, lightning round over to you. So as far as Calder, the one that really just kind of hit me in a very immediate way was Spider. Because I feel like that one, it just, it, it kind of like, um, it makes, it's a very immediate and very effective demonstration of the way that physical balance was central to what Calder was doing in the fact that it's, you know, it's, it's a, a kind of standing mobile. Is that what that's, they're called? The st stabiles, I think? Yeah. yeah. Anyway, it, but it's a fulcrum type of affair. And on one side, in this particular case, it, on one side, there's just one big flange on one side of the fulcrum and on the other all of these kind of sprouting branching tendrils and that very explicit contrast of one large kind of heavier thing on one side and then this profusion of the smaller more ethereal stuff being kind of elevated at the same time as counterbalanced by the other side it just kind of is like it's self-explanatory you take one look at it and you understand immediately 
the principles that govern the work and that Calder was working with, his kind of thought process or what I imagine to be his thought process is just like directly manifest at first glance in the work. Um, so that one hit me in a very immediate way. Uh, in the Sapphire show, I wanna mention two works very briefly. One was all, another work by Senga Ngudi, which was the study for Mesh Mirage, which was from 77. It's a very beautiful photograph um, of, um, you know, a, a kind of figure or person draped with this uh, sort of elaborate costume. And, but, but right next to it was another work, Sapphire in Tunis uh, from Suzanne Jackson, which is from about 10 years ago. And it's this kind of like assemblage a wall bound irregular two part assemblage. Um, but the fact that they were placed right next to each other by the installation, like it kind of endowed this wall piece with a sort of bodily character that it wouldn't have had if it wasn't directly in dialogue with the, the Nanguti photograph next to it. And I mentioned this because like, I mean, that, that kind of choice to place them next to each other hit me immediately. I didn't, and, and but also like the fact that we're dealing with a work from 10 years ago and a work from the seventies, it demonstrates the fact that like the show is kind of constructing meaning in ways that is independent of like the specific historically or specifically historical narrative. Thanks, man. I like that. that, that that's a really keen observation. Um, Amanda, over to you for the lightning round. Okay, for the Calder, um, well, obviously the spider and the, the snow flurries would be my choices. So I'm gonna go with the shark, shark sucker. Um, <laughs> which is a, a, a wooden club essentially that's very crudely carved into the shape of a shark. Um, I love it. I want it. Um, if I were to go and take things out of MoMA right now, that might be on my list, although it could be kind of heavy. Um, it, it doesn't do any of the things necessarily that Calder does. Like it doesn't move, it doesn't have balance. Um, it does have wit, um, which I really appreciate. And um, yeah, I talk about satisfying. Wow, um, I really want it. And then from the Sapphire show, um, I agree the water compositions were stunning. Um, and I, I have to say, since they were remade, I would be really curious to know what the originals would look like now. Um, and uh, I, don't, I don't know if they still exist or not. I'm assuming they don't. Um, but that does place um, Ngudi into that particular historical time. Um, she was not the only person making work with, with colored liquid um, at this moment, which is kind of fascinating and uh, really, really hard to research because of course, you know, if you do a Google search for like artwork made with colored liquid, um, yeah, that's paint. <laughs> so so <laughs> those, are, those are really, really hard to research. But I, I would also point out the Betty Saar um, Auntie and Watermelon, um, which is a tiny little box in a museum vitrine, and it has um, a mammy figure and a, a shotgun. Um, and um, just brilliant way of juxtaposing these two, these two figures. Um, and it reminded me of my favorite work of SARS, which is the, the Antimima Molotov cocktail, which mm. is one of the most brilliant works of art I've ever seen. I couldn't agree more. I, uh, I really, I, I, I thought Shark Sucker, that, that took me by surprise. That was not a work that I was familiar with. And when I turned the corner after seeing the wire sculptures, which I am overly exposed to, and saw that little wooden object on the ground. I I, I laughed out loud in the uh, in the in the sanctuary of MoMA. Um, I, uh, I another thing that struck me about the MoMA show was um, I, I tried to think for a little bit of how how you define a house artist. You know, like what is a house artist? Um, uh, and one of the things I started thinking of when I was trying to answer for myself as I was uh, going through the show, um, was noticing where everything came from. And it seemed like, I mean, it, as is not uncommon, like many gifts, um, but also uh, many commissions. And then I started, you know, doing a walk around and saying, oh, well, actually a lot of these gifts are from the same people. Um, Eve's, uh, his neighbor Eve's, uh, who I, I, another work that really made me laugh. They're like, oh, I'm gonna, 
I, I, I'm, I'm sorry, I don't have my notes on me, but the one that he made as an homage to his friend's effort at sobriety yeah. um, was just like, yeah, okay, yeah, that that's silly, you know, and uh, and um, and 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 all the like all the jewelry and things that he made for his friends and the letters. It, it started to really occur to me that like I, I feel the community here. I feel I feel how. Um, this man could have become the uh, the first household name of this you know this small group of um, art elites in New York, but uh, but before we before we go down the, the the rabbit hole of Alexander Calder, I'd, I'd like to I'd like to go into a discussion of the Sapphire Show. Um, Lewis, if you're if 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 you would uh, give us a little slideshow of the um, of the exhibition before we uh, begin. Thank you, Lewis. Yeah, I was struck by the arrangement of those water pieces as well. I mean, yeah. 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 That quilted piece really struck me too, especially with how high it was hung on the wall. Yeah. I wanted to know more about that, the, you know, the installation itself. Yeah, rag to wobble. Lewis, can you hold here for a moment? This one, this one really caught me. Uh, it stopped me in my tracks. I, I walked around this so many times, just admiring. Uh, you can see the way the light comes in the gallery there, and and this thing, it's 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 it, it felt floating. It felt heavy. It 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 had so much in it that uh, just really. Uh, really astounded me. Um, one of those pieces for me that, that, that seemed timeless. Mm. I like these two. Thank you, Lewis. Um, okay, we touched on this a little bit. Um, so I'm going to, since we just saw the works, I'm going to, um, I'm going, let's, let's talk about their material bodies. Um, let's talk about the material intelligence that we felt um, in the various works. A number of us have already spoken of the water works and how that was something that really you know, kind of got got right to a core of something. Um, let's go around and 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 identify a work that was particularly stunning for its material qualities. I, I'll start this one um, because one of the artists that I did not know and and count myself lucky to now know is um, Gloria Bohannon, and um, I I found uh, the combination of, of materials that, that this artist was using to put together uh, pieces, the wood and the different papers and the paints and the threads and it it, it all it, it it was so so well constructed. You know, as a person who kind of tries to when I look at made things, I often go to, well, where is the intersection of one thing and another thing? Like, where's the fastener? Where's the, 
where did, where does it come together? Um, and, and in examining many of her pieces, uh, I, I, when I say that every scene was seamless, you know, what I really mean is, is like um, the attention that was so obviously paid to the construction of these objects was, um, was, was just stunning to me. Lewis, if you could zoom in on, on pretty much any, I don't, I don't know if we'll, if we'll have the uh, resolution quality. Um, but uh, another thing was that, uh, um, yeah, yeah, they also, you know, they, they took me, uh, they took me to a, a place where art is not always made for things being inside. Um, they felt like things that had a lot of, um, a lot of sentimental power that I couldn't access, but I could see was a thing that was, was there in the images of the people, the selections of, uh, of, of music that were chosen, the scores in certain places. Um, these pieces, uh, th these pieces to me just had a, a, a great deal of energy um, and, and what, I call, what I call material intelligence for lack of a better way of articulating um, the felt connection to the artist's hand through the object. Um, for me, I could, I could sense it well there. Um, and I'm curious uh, to pass it over to Amanda, was there one that you would uh, single out for its uh, quote unquote material intelligence? Yeah, I really appreciated um, Eileen Nelson's Wood City, mm -hmm. um, which uh, Lewis is like a, a, an open block that then has um, <laughs> different pieces of wood like bricolaged basically on top of it. Um, I. I don't know why I was totally really struck by this piece. Um, I think that this is probably something that Ben was talking about um, based on where it was uh, installed in the gallery. It had a really nice conversation going um, with some of the other artworks. Um, I really appreciated that it was three-dimensional but you could look through it. Um, for some reason that always really strikes me. <laughs> and um, it, it felt like it was kind of of its time, but also transcended that time. Um, if we think about, um, you know, the, the wood sculptures that are being made at this period, um, you know, obviously uh, you know, we might think most obviously of someone like Carl Andre, or we could think about Donald Judd and his plywood sculptures, but we could also think about Martin Purrier um, we could think about Mildred Thompson, um, who recently had a, a really, really fabulous show um, at Gallery Le Long. And so I think that it, it, it places itself through its material in this really, really rich vein of sculpture, which I deeply, deeply appreciated. And then, of course, just the idea of building a, a city out of these things. Um, just, you know, it, it hits me where it counts, I guess. What about all the little, uh, the little vials of material? Uh, that, that really struck me as well. There were so many details. I remember looking closely at this work, again, looking for you know, the joints and, and finding so many beautiful moments. I took a picture of, uh, of, there's one scene where you can see a painted circle and it's like this kind of clementine colored circle that is, is, is a surprise when you come around the corner and and um, and find it. It's it's mm -hmm. sort of like oh wow here are you. Um, I, I, I which kind of reminded me of some of my favorite city experiences. You know when you're sort of in a neighborhood that you know you like and you turn a corner and you see something that you weren't really looking for, but then it just it it, it excites you when you see it. Mm -hmm. I like that. Uh, ben, Ben, uh, how about how about uh, how about an experience for you? So I, I'm also going to single out Wood City, man. Uh, it's a work that really kind of kept me off. It, it, when I first encountered it and looked at it, it kind of hit me off balance. Even just the title, Wood City, like I it was kind of like off kilter to me. I mean, our in, urban environments they're, they're dominated by metal and concrete and brick. You know, there's wood certainly, but it's not the first thing you think of. And so I sat with it for a while and thought, why, you know, why is this kind of knocking me off balance this way, but, but kind of captivating me anyway. And 
over time, eventually, as I just kind of looked at it and then later thought about it, I realized that I think the choice to make this thing out of wood primarily and then to embed these little bits of, you know, this, that, and the other, the kind of materials and detritus that are introduced into the kind of elaborate, like, fantasy skyscraper, if you will, on top, like, for me, it just really evoked kind of both sides of living in a city, the fact that it's kind of chaotic and it can be alienating and intimidating, but it's a kind of chaos and intimidation even that's like very deeply lived and human at the same time. I think the, the materials and the hand, the evident handmadeness of it um, mm -hmm. just kind of all comes together to produce that effect for me. Yeah. I would have loved to have seen this one flat on the floor. I, th I, th I know that would be dangerous for it and I understand yeah. why it's up on a plinth, but I would love to have seen it on the floor actually and see how the, it kind of responded to that. Yeah, the decision to put it on a plinth, I mean, it elevates it in, <laughs> in multiple ways. Uh, <laughs> yeah, that was cheesy, I'm sorry. Uh, <laughs> Jess, over to you. So um, I will also put in my word for Wood City, which I mean, in terms of materiality was to me one of the most um, uh, interesting works in the show. To me, this work felt like, and I won't, I, I won't talk about it too much since we've so well covered it, but I will say that I think, um, I felt when I was looking at this piece that this was just an artist that was kind of making something for herself. She was, um, I felt it was very experimental and um, the imperfections of it in some places are actually uh, make it more appealing. Um, and I liked seeing it in contrast to the other one I wanted to mention, which was um, the collage painting that was hanging nearby by Yvonne Colomeo, um, Status Quo which to me was like such a fully formed work. One of those ones that um, was just so rich and you know, she even made the frame that it's contained in. Um, but then the way the, the play money is embedded into the paint is, was just so um, sophisticated to me and also um, really presents a kind of powerful political message that I think I think the artist was trying to communicate um, and seeing those two works almost in tandem, if I'm remembering right, they, they were, the sculpture was kind of sitting almost kitty quarter in front of the collage. Um, seeing them together was a very powerful moment of the show for me. Mm. Yeah, that status quo painting was, uh, that was a tremendous work as well. Mm -hmm. I have one more question uh, that I want to ask each of you um, about the sapphire, and then I do want to switch over to Alexander Calder because I want to be mindful of our time. <clears throat> the, the original show was obviously built around the spirit of artistic camaraderie. These women coming together uh, on the 4th of July to put together a show. Um, how much of that spirit of artistic camaraderie could you still feel? Was that energy... Uh, present for you in the exhibition? Was it, uh, or was it just a historical aside at this point? I feel like I got glimpses of it throughout the show. Again, like for example, in this um, picture that we're looking at with the, with the collage, with the sculpture, they're both works that, you know, we don't know if they were exactly in the show, but they could have been, you know, they were made, they're from the right time period. Um, to me, those were the, when those, when I came across those moments, I, I felt that sort of communal spirit. Um, you know, I think, I think the organizers did an interesting thing here because they really didn't have a lot to go on in trying to imagine what this show may have looked like. Um, so they had to make some decisions that, um, you know, incorporated works from other times. But to me, that's what evokes the spirit is these works where you're looking at them and thinking, well, it could have, it could have been there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thanks, Jess. Uh, ben, how about for you? Could you still uh, sense that energy? Yeah, I mean, replicating, you know, the energy of a historical moment or an event is always going to be something that's very, very difficult for an exhibition to do. But I, I did feel that camaraderie. And similar to what Jess was saying, I, I kind of saw it in the relationship 
that basically I saw it in the pretty kind of canny installation choices that the organizers made mm -hmm. and the way they emphasized di different kinds of contact and dialogue between works by different artists, and, but also by uh, works by the same artists in the past and closer to the present. So there are these links that are being forged between the people, but also across time. Um, and I think, you know, the, the, the relationship between status quo and Wood City was one that struck me as well. Um, I already mentioned one previously of two works that were next to each other, but you know, it could also be a simple, there was a, a, a pairing that kind of struck me, um, Betty Starr's Ante and Watermelon, and next to it, Yvonne Cole's, uh, Yvonne Cole Mayo's uh, painting Generations. Uh, you know, these are pretty disparate in time, but, and it's a simple thing, you know, they both kind of emphasize these narrow vertical forms. They both emphasize familial structure or relationships. And just, you know, simple things like that, that kind of make you think about the relationships between the works, I think, go a long way towards suggesting the kind of shared concerns, shared values, shared community that informed the original show. Yeah, thanks, Ben. That makes a lot of sense to me. I like the idea of the artistic camaraderie um, being organic and expanding further rather than the idea that it is something that is like somehow bottled and uh, and, and tries to tries to be remade. Um, I, I agree that I think that is that's that's I, always I, gonna be a, a, a tough challenge. Yeah, I mean, and this show the, the attention that it pays to the kind of temporal relationship between where we stand now and the time period of the original show and the emphasis on kind of recreation without replication. Mm. It just, it, it, it did a lot for me. And I think it really served the purpose of making, making the original experience of, of the show kind of legible to us in the moment. Yeah, I like that. Thanks, thanks Ben. Um, uh, Amanda, uh, how, how was your experience of the, the sense of artistic camaraderie? What, uh, what, what, what elements of it remained for you? Um, I definitely agree with Jess and with Ben. Um, I, I was thinking about it in terms of, um, you know, going back to the, the city, um, the works that you could see through to other works. Um, you know, the, the piece by Suzanne Jackson that you particularly liked too, Charlie, um, you know, it, it had a certain translucency to it. Um, and so if you stood near to it, you could kind of get glimpses of other works through it. Um, and so there was a really important way that um, it was, everything was installed to think about sight lines. Um, coloristically too, the works really, really spoke to each other really well. This is a good image to look at here. Um, you know, we're looking at a, a photograph with rich purples in the background. We have the Suzanne Jackson in the foreground. Then we have the, the Bohannon works um, on the left and coloristically also, they're having this really nice back and forth. Um, I think too, just keeping the, the name, um, you've come a long way, baby. I think that's actually super important for the show, right? Um, and, and it actually kind of justifies um, not that it needed it, but it, it kind of calls out to the idea that we are looking at things that were made relatively recently and things that were made um, further back in time. And, um, you know, I think that actually has a lot to say to us in terms of um, these women's artistic practices, but also, um, you know, our, our curatorial and art historical priorities right now. And so I, I think that the show did a really, really fabulous job with this. Yeah. One, one thing I want to say about the title, unless, unless I misunderstood, but the way I see it, they, they flipped the title. So the original was the Sapphire Show, You've Come a Long Way, Baby. This one is You've Come a Long Way, Baby, the Sapphire Show. Mm -hmm. And it's a simple choice, but it's one that it, it, it just underlines the kind of self-reflexivity and the, 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 the very interesting approach to kind of historical presentation that you find in this show. So simple, but very effective for me. Yeah, there was that really wonderful painting to the Roots painting, which of course, you know, is so of its time. Um, I remember my parents watching Roots on TV, um, you know, this really, really important mini series. And so it's kind of moving backwards in time and then also pushing forwards in time. And again, these, these Gloria Bohannon works are so wonderful in this respect, right? I mean, they're, they're not like pushing you away. They're actually looking as though they're going to like pull you closer to them and kind of embrace you there. And, I think it just, it worked really, really nicely.
Yeah, I was, um, it was remarkable to me how um, the material in the vitrine uh, seemed old and historical and the artwork made in the same period didn't. And um, it, was, it was one of those things where I felt like uh, we, we were in a time capsule in the front of the gallery and in the back of the gallery time uh, kind of dropped away. Um, but I, I, I think that, uh, I, I also think, and, and we haven't mentioned this yet, but I, I think the materials that were on display in those vitrines uh, was, was really gave me a feeling of, uh, gave me an image, a lot of images in my mind to, um, to imagine um, the initial show. And, and more, than, more than images, it also, you know, there was a lot of, I could see a lot of humans engaged in, in, in an activity that was like not uh, commercial and professional by the standards of the art world that we uh, operate in um, and took me to a place of, uh, of, of, of art exhibitions uh, whose purpose was other than uh, sales. Um, and, you know, I think, I think a lot of times that is taken for granted. Um, and when I was in the space, you know, one of the things that did not I, I didn't feel, uh, I, I felt as if I had moved away from the commercial nature of a lot of the contemporary art world. And there was, um, there was a, a spirit of camaraderie that, that, that was generated for me just in that, uh, in that you know, in, in that opening moment of, of recognizing um, where the show is coming from. Uh, I would like to switch now to discuss a little bit about Alexander Calder. Um, Lewis, if you wouldn't mind giving us a spin through uh, the Calder images, and um, I'm going to I'm I, I'm going to um, I'm only going to pose one Calder question to the th to the three of you. So um, get ready because it's going to be a good one. <laughs> hmm. That's the piece I couldn't remember the name of, yeah. For three years of fairly good behavior. <laughs> and he, he made it for Eve Tongi when Tongi was trying to stay sober. Uh, I don't know a lot of uh, Calder works where his handwriting is such a prominent part of the piece. Yeah, it's, it's very rare. That's one of very few I can think of. You can kind of see that candelabrum in the background, like I reflected. I loved that thing. Yeah. Okay. Well, before you, you, you're jumping, you're jumping the gun on me, Amanda. <laughs> okay. uh, I, I, since we all uh, uh, have had a lot of exposure with Alexander Calder, some of us more than others in this uh, Zoom room, um, I would love for, I would love to essentially just single out a work that um, that caught you by surprise, or a detail in a work that caught you by surprise. Um, for me, I can think of uh, a couple. So uh, allow me to take the lead. And once again, forgive me for not having my notes in front of me because I had this spelled out beautifully on the piece of paper that I, I don't have handy. Uh, <laughs> but in the, in the opening room uh, with the three sculptures, um, the bolts, the bolts change. You know, I, I, here I am again, back to like how, how are pieces put together? How are things fastened? Um, the older of the two works had circular heads on the bolts. Mm -hmm. The newer of the two works um, had, I want to say, square or hexagonal heads. Mm -hmm. Also, when I went to the works list of the, uh, of the wall label to just say like, hmm, you know, like, is there any other difference? Or is it just like, is it all the same? Is it just sheet metal paint? Um, the older work noted the use of the bolts as a material, whereas the newer, uh, the newer one did not. Um, assuming, you know, that everyone's done their job to the best of their ability, which is how I, I, I operate. Um, these were not mistakes of the curatorial team. These were not house mistakes. These are, this was a fine distinction uh, for the artist. Um, to what end the, the fastener um, was significant to Calder, I 
I don't know. Um, but once I started looking at these two objects with a specific eye to where the bolts were placed, um, where they were when I looked at, at where I, when I viewed them, um, I would say that I was left with more questions than answers. Mm -hmm. uh, and I, I, you know, I would, I would, um, I would, I would revisit this. Uh, I would revisit these works and these and this tiny detail. Um, and to, to just wonder, like, uh, did the did the small thing become less relevant? Did the small thing, yeah, why, why, why did it change? Why was it why was it no longer considered a material in the sculpture, and could like be left out of that? Uh, I don't want to say historical narrative, but the material narrative of the object. Um, and these, you know, these were the show pieces uh, front and center. Um, so, you know, I, I, what could I say? I circumnavigated these objects for a while, looking at the bolts uh, and, and thinking about, you know, also one was one you would use a wrench to a fasten. The other one, what you would use a screwdriver to fasten. So even just imagining the artist uh, and how close his hand had to be and, and, you know, how his body had to be positioned in order to, uh, to, to, to make these things come together. Um, yeah, it just struck me as like, on one hand, they look super similar, but on the other hand, there's no way the construction was super similar. Um, so, so that was something that, that you know, that, that I, that I, I stewed upon uh, as, I, as I passed along. Um, uh, perhaps rather than going to our de facto Calder uh, expert, <laughs> we'll, we'll go back to Amanda uh, and, and, and find out what, uh, what work or what detail surprised her. Well, obviously I'm going to say the candelabra, <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, which I had never seen before. Um, I, I don't know, I, I was not aware of it before. Um, and I loved thinking about um, how long it was, how it does this kind of like loop to loop and roller coaster ride, um, how hot the dinner would have been <laughs> with all of those candles, um, because there's so many of them. Um, you know, and then like, that puts me in mind of like, yeah, there's the loop-de-loop, -loop. Um, like the smell of the room, um, you know, uh, candles burning, you have food, you have drink, you have people um, in close quarters, um, you know, if it was hot, like it's been here recently, um, you know, just like human smells and everything, um, it was incredibly, incredibly evocative to me. And um, really, really thought about it too, because it felt so fresh. Um, this is something that I always am struck by with Calder. Um, he, he just strikes me as being so fresh. And yet these things are almost a hundred years old. Um, that is kind of mind blowing to consider. And, uh, you know, I, I find that fascinating too. How do you live out of your own period while somehow making things that are fully of your period? Um, so this, this is mine. I would just really, really loved it. And uh, again, we'll take it um, if I have, you know, the arm capacity with shark sucker as well. <laughs> and passing the mic to you. Sorry, I was just, uh... My wife, I just dropped out there for a second. And it may have dropped out again. Oh, and we'll oh, oh, okay. No, I think I'm back. I think I'm okay. back. Yeah, you're with us. You're with us. Okay, sorry. I'll be brief just in case this happens again. The one, the one work that I want to shout out right now is um, Swizzle Sticks. And the reason that this one struck me is because it really emphasized for me what it is. It's basically a mobile that's suspended in front of a, a red back plane. And the reason that this struck out to me is because it really emphasized for me how non-dogmatic um, and kind of om omnivorous Calder's understanding of modern art was um, in the sense that when I looked at it, I couldn't help thinking about the fact that that back plane is basically a monochrome painting. Um, you know, it's like an icon of kind of classic purist modernist reduction. But of course, Calder, you know, he, he thinks about that and he says, okay, but no, we're going to make something out of it that's totally contingent on your, you know, on your relationship in space that moves, that's playful, that's funny, you know, and he was able to kind of deal with both of those competing impulses in a really 
compelling and really witty way. Um, and I really appreciated that because it's a theme that you see in all of his work, the fact that he's kind of a surrealist, but you know, also so inspired by Mondrian at the same time, you know, he's just kind of always operating between the, the kind of reductive stereotypes that you sometimes find in, uh, in, in art history. Um, I mean, even the fact that he takes a look at Mondrian and says, but what if we made it move, you know? It's just, I love that attitude and I saw that attitude in, in this work. Yeah. Thanks, Ben. Jess, will you, uh, will you bring us home with a, a, a piece or a detail that um, caught you by surprise? Sure. Um, I mean, the one that I really uh, have to go back to, and I sense, Charlie, that you're a fan of it, too, is um, for three years of fairly good behavior. Because to <laughs> me, it's something that just, I mean, every part of it is so much um, representative of what Calder was doing throughout his life. Um, you know, it is both funny and profound. You know, I mean, a lot of a, a lot has been written about Calder's work being time-based because it moves, because it moves through space. And so here you have this mobile that is this little time-based work that also is marking, liter quite literally marking time, you know? Uh, it's, hmm. like a, it's like different layers of time in this very pretty simple little mobile. Um, he also is using plexiglass here, which is like an unusual, um, uh, medium for him, but at the time he was um, he was involved in a competition for designing an award, um, and the award, like one of the parameters of the co competition, was it had to be made out of plexiglass. I forget what the award is for now, but anyway, he had plexiglass lying around, and this is like another um, you know tenet of Calder's practice is just. Um, using the materials that he had available. So he probably had leftover pieces and fashioned it into this mobile for Tangi, which is both funny and, um, you know, a, 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 a moment, a, a tribute to somebody's life. Um, and so this is one that always makes me smile whenever I see it. I, uh... I agree. I, I smiled uh, when I saw it. I also, it also, I felt like said something about <laughs> about these two men relationship because, uh, as anyone who knows anyone else who's made an effort at sobriety, uh, <laughs> congratulating them for basically giving up is uh, that's, that's 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 atypical. Uh, so, uh, so you know, I, I can only imagine the relationship that they had. Uh, and I saw how many how many works were donated by. Yves Tangay's, uh, his, his wife, you know? So, I mean, the relationship between those two men, which I, I don't know much about, was, was very evident to me, um, just in the nature of the works that, that the curators decided to put on view for the show. That is one thing about this show that I think um, it does elucidate nicely, is just how rich um, Calder's relationships and friendships were throughout his life. I mean, it's another thing that gets touched on quite a lot when people write about Calder, but I feel like in this show, you really get to see it through the gifts that were given to the museum, um, through the people he was giving them to, um, you know, the personal works that are in the case at the end. Um, you know, I, I think if, if, you know, if I wanted to think about exhibitions in the future, like thinking about friendships, great friendships throughout history is something I, I'm, you know, interested in, and um, I think brings art back into humanity, um, even when it's on display in this very austere circumstance. Yeah, uh, it's yeah. a different way of thinking about a house artist. Yeah, it's the artist you want in your house. In your house. <laughs> <laughs> I like that. I like also that so many of these things were gifts, you know, like this, this that we have on screen was a gift from uh, one artist to another, a gift from the artist's uh, widow to the museum. Um, I liked the, the passage of this object as a, as a gift item, you know, this thing's never had a value outside of its gift exchange. And that, that, that seems special to me uh, in a way that, that is often lost with a lot of these um, canonized artists because I, I feel that in the sense of looking at something that is so, uh, an artist like Calder who's so art historically validated and qualified mm -hmm. that it's it's easy to lose track of the, um, 
the, the, the things like this that were made, uh, you know, as gifts made, they, they weren't made to, to win competitions. They were made, you know, uh, with a different intent. And um, one of the things that made me really happy about the Calder show was that these, these, these pieces were brought forward. Um, uh, so yes, I would like to kind of conclude with that idea of friendship and camaraderie that, that I think we found in, in, in both exhibitions. Um, I want to, I want to thank everyone for joining me today on the Zoom screen and, and thank all of you who are watching. Um, I am going to bring our uh, episode to a close uh, in the traditional manner that we do on the Rails daily broadcast, uh, uh, which is based on our lunchtime activities prior to the pandemic. We always read poems. Uh, the poem that I have selected to close us out today um, is from the uh, new book of Bob Kaufman's collected works, put together by uh, Neely Tchaikovsky, Raymond Foy, and Kate Swindle, the very, very beautiful forward written by Devorah Major. Um, I chose this because of Bob's relationship to uh, particularly the Watts Tower, um, I, I don't know yet if there is any story of how Bob Kaufman um, goes to see the show, but uh, the set, the first Sapphire show. But I, I don't think it's it's unrealistic that that you know he he maybe did or or maybe heard about it. Um, this this is is uh, in, in honor of that possible moment. It's called Walk Sounds. Soft noise where crystalline sap dwells, tree bark houses, tree bark shoes, long green journeys into sounds of death, cries of who blows, who blows, who blows, rings of raindrops on damp streets, quietly disappearing in fear modeled night, sweeping over asphalt mesas to long gutters where gray birds lie, Gone time is buried. Safe from hideous laughter, babblings of sidewalk fools, tongues straining, flickering on steps of air nervously, blowing blue, black, blue, black in the shapes of night. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thanks, yeah, Charlie. Thanks for having me on. Thanks, Jess. Thanks, Ben. Thanks, Lewis. Thanks, Lewis. Ben, Lewis, Charlie, have a great day. <laughs>